Hi everyone, Quivine here from MTU's Blackrock Castle Observatory. In this video, we are going to continue looking at nebulae, which we were talking quite a lot about in our shorter Twitter videos earlier this week. We're moving right up to 10 o'clock so that it's nice and dark, Leo's nice and high there in the south, but we're actually going to be looking back towards the constellation of Taurus. So we're looking at Mars here and our crescent moon. So the new moon was just a few days ago. If we zoom in a little bit closer, you'll see the moon is quite a narrow crescent. But we're looking under Mars and across from the moon here. And we're going to be looking for M1, which was the first Messier object. Now this Messier object, uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky to find. There we go. Uh, this Messier object, the Crab Nebula, it's a supernova remnant. So we've seen planetary nebulae, we've seen diffuse nebulae. A supernova remnant is sort of a nebula as well. It is a cloud-like shape of dust and other materials. But this is the remains of a massive star that's collapsed in on itself and then exploded in a supernova. Whereas a planetary nebula, it's the remains of a much smaller star that shed its layers more like an onion. This was the first item in Me Charles Messier's catalogue of things that looked like comets but weren't really comets uh, because Charles Messier back in the 1700s was looking for comets but uh, he kept finding these other fuzzy shapes in the sky as well. And we can see there's a lot of these deep sky objects. More of them than you might think are Messier objects. For example, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, they're M45, the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. These are some of the most amazing things that you can look at in the sky, like the Andromeda Galaxy through a powerful telescope. Uh, if we get rid of our light pollution and our atmosphere here, it looks absolutely amazing. And the same is true for the Pleiades, uh, even through a good pair of binoculars, they were a really amazing looking thing to take a closer look at. And we'll zoom in on them quickly here. But a lot of what Charles Messier saw were globular clusters and uh, different sorts of nebulae. And there are some very different sorts. For example, if we take a look in here towards Orion, and uh, we'll get rid of that uh, light and atmosphere again, you can see there's a lot of color here. There's uh, some dark blacks, there's some brighter kind of bluish colors, there's some reddishy pink colors. These are all different types of diffuse nebulae. So we've got these dark nebulae that block out light, the bluish reflection nebulae that are reflecting light, and the reddish emission nebulae that are hot enough to emit their own light. And they're what we'd normally think of as nebulae today. Supernova remnants are usually called supernova remnants, and planetary nebulae, well, we know that they're not really the same as these other nebulae, and we know that they're not planets because they come from a very different source. And the one that we looked at uh, was back in the direction of the north, so we'll turn back around to there. Here we are already looking in the direction of Vega in Lyra, and there's the ring nebula just a little bit lower in the sky. And this is another Messier object, M57. And again, it's a really nice thing to see in the sky. If we get rid of that atmosphere and light pollution again, it's got these amazing colors, this lovely circular kind of shape. And this is what happens when a star more similar to our sun reaches the end of its life, starts running out of fuel, starts expanding and getting cooler, and eventually gets unstable enough that it starts shedding these different layers of elements that it's built up over its, you know, millions and billions of years of a lifespan, usually leaving behind something like a white dwarf right in the middle, sort of the ember of the star, not producing its own heat or fusion anymore, but it's still got a lot of heat left over from when it was a burning fusion generating star. So that's M57, and there are a lot of these Messier objects. Uh, if we go down a little down here, uh, there's an M27, which is another one of these um, uh, planetary nebula. M56, I think, is a globular cluster. It is indeed. Uh, if we take a look for M27, uh, M27 is the Dumbbell Nebula. There we go. Uh, or Apple Core Nebula. It's got a really nice clear shape where it's split off these two different sides. You can see, I think it kind of does look more like an Apple Core than a Dumbbell. But this is also the remains, it's a planetary nebula, so the remains of a star that blew itself apart, but not quite as even and spherical as the ring nebula. This is a bipolar nebula. It's got these two sort of poles. Of course, you know, stars have a north and a south. They rotate just like planets and most other things in space are rotating. So that can have an effect on the way that this material sheds off, depending on the speed of the star, its mass, its magnetic field can influence how these different things disperse in space as well. So planetary nebula, they've got amazing, amazing, 
amazing colors to them because of all the different elements that the star has built up over time and then eventually released out into space. Whereas these diffuse nebula, they do have some nice colors, but they don't usually have quite as many. You're usually just getting, you know, reds and pinks, blues and purples, and then dark, dark nebulae that block out the light behind them. You can see we've got a lot of these fuzzy shapes all over the sky, and uh, some of them will be Messier objects, even if they don't necessarily say Messier in their name. Uh, a lot of these objects also have, you know, more famous names, and we often use those more famous names when we're talking about them, you know, for example, with the Andromeda Galaxy. Others are more famous as their Messier object name. So this is an open star cluster, a bit more like the Pleiades, not a globular cluster. All of these different Messier objects, you know, there's there's up to 110 of them now, and not all of them were actually uh, put into the catalog by Charles Messier himself. Some of them were discovered, you know, in the 1960s instead of back in the 1700s, which is when most of these things were mistaken for comets, and that's one of the nice things about them. They were mistaken for comets back in the 1700s, so today with our more powerful telescopes, it's very clear that there's something different, and in many cases, something quite beautiful. So there is a challenge known as the Messier Marathon where astronomers, you know, they start over there with uh, Messier 1 very often and start moving their way through looking at all the different Messier objects. Now, doing it in order from 1 to 110 is pretty tough, but doing them from, you know, sunset to sunrise, covering all these different parts of the sky, it can help you find potentially all of the Messier objects, all 110 of them. Uh, Messier was a French astronomer, so he saw these things from France, so in the Northern Hemisphere, just like us. And uh, summer, unfortunately, is often a good time to see them because of the angle that we're tilted at. It brings some things that were pretty easy for Messier to see. It brings them into a bit better of a view for us here in Ireland. So Messier marathons are something that needs to be planned out, something that you need to, you know, usually take a bit of care with. Make sure that you've got the right objects above you. Make sure that you have your telescope set up and ready. Here's another one. And it lets you see some of these amazing, beautiful things that were you know, mistaken for other shapes in the past. So here we go, M24. It's a field of stars, not a nebula, not a globular cluster. I have no idea why Charles Messier thought this looked like a comet, but it's a really nice thing in the sky to see, and it's coming up close to the sunrise, you know, on the opposite end of the night from our M1 way back in Taurus. So it gives you these things, this list of objects that you can spend all night moving through. And it can be a really, really fun thing to do, especially under darker skies. If you get the chance to, you know, go out into the countryside and get a really clear view of these objects, even just finding them roughly with a good pair of binoculars can be quite the achievement because it's almost more similar to what Charles Messier would have had to do. Now, of course, it can be very difficult to actually find all of them. And sometimes there's sort of a beginner Messier marathons where you stick to the ones that are more easily visible to the eye. You know, things like the Pleiades, which are getting pretty close to the sun at the moment. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, if you're in a dark sky, these are things you can find just with your eyes. But with a good telescope and a dark sky and a fair bit of patience and planning, you can see 110 objects over the course of the night. And they are some of the most impressive ones you can see. So in a future long video, we will be uh, going through a Messier marathon. Uh, working out exactly what order to view the objects in can be tricky, and they would really look better if we were in a slightly different location or, uh, you know, lower down closer to the equator in winter time. But we will do our best, and we'll do our best to find all of these different Messier objects. So I hope you come back and take a look at that video as well.